I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today, and I hope you find this little foray into the world of food security interesting. I've put evolution or revolution because actually I see synthetic biology as, as another tool that helps us move forward in the fight against food security and I see it as a, almost a natural evolution from where we are from GM and hopefully I'll just give you a little introduction to the story, both the, the, the challenges, the benefits and the potential uh, difficulties that we face. Let me just get this. So what I'm going to talk about, as I say, the challenges we face, what the current state of play is, future developments, potential blockers, and then bring it all together at the end. So the first part. You'll have heard, or a number of you will have heard John Beddington talk about the perfect storm. We face these enormous challenges in terms of the growing population. The expectation is a population will be somewhere between 9 and 10 billion by 2050. And of course, a lot of that are fed through agriculture, and agriculture needs, needs water. Nothing grows without water. 70% of the world's fresh water is used in agriculture. So there's this real demand for ensuring the efficient use of water that we have. And in some, some areas like northern Pakistan and Egypt, they're effectively mining water. And actually, it's also true in um, uh, central USA, where the groundwater is getting depleted fairly rapidly and soon will run out, which will, of course, have massive consequences. But not only that, the world is becoming more affluent. And as a number of people in Asia become more affluent, their diet changes. So, for example, 20 years ago in China, the average intake of meat per year was 4 kilos. It's now 50 kilos a year. And that multiplied by a billion and something people is a lot more meat. And, of course, meat is not a very efficient way of delivering calories and nutrition. I think it takes something like between seven and eight kilos of maize to generate one kilo of beef. So uh, uh, if you're going to go for a meat diet, which is important to us all for other reasons, then actually you need a massive increase in the amount of feed grain that you're growing. And of course, these demands are met primarily through agriculture. But of course, if you plow up more land, you destroy biodiversity. And the downside of plowing up more land as well is actually you release CO2 into the atmosphere. So if you look at greenhouse gas production, 30% of, of today's greenhouse gas production is the consequences of agriculture. 18% of that is from land use change, ripping up savanna and ripping up uh, rainforest. The other 12% is from agriculture. And most of that's actually from the production of nitrogen, which we need to put the protein into our food but also the action of denitrifying bacteria generating nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. But as always, it's never as simple as it appears in the headlines. <clears throat> so if you actually look at today, two in seven people are malnourished. A billion go to bed hungry every night, and another billion are undernourished in terms of lacking vitamins and minerals. And these cause massive health imbalances and impacts. If you look elsewhere in the world, you'll find there's almost 2 billion people who are now overweight and more than 500 million who are obese. So actually, if you look at the balance, we do produce enough calories to give everyone, I think it's 2,800 calories a day. The problem is some don't get it and some get too much. And so the issue in terms of food security for those who are very poor is first to deliver enough calories to them. And then second, to make sure they have a very balanced nutrition, a balanced diet, or if not, a specially crafted diet that enables them to get the right nutrients. And similarly, with the obese part of the population, they need better quality food. The solution is both technological and political. And today I'm going to focus mainly on the technological, but you'll see how politics plays in the food space, because food is very important in cultural sense, and often it's used as a weapon to drive different behaviors. So where are we now? <coughs> Surprisingly, actually, modern agriculture is based on four basic technologies. Mechanization, which is primarily the comb internal combustion engine for tractors and for water pumps, because you need to prepare your soil and then you need to make sure it's moist and water is delivered. 
Uh, the second part of the revolution was modern fertilizers supplementing natural fertilizers. That's enabled growth to go fantastically well. And you can see from this graph in the developed world, production has more than trebled since the 60s. Um, about 50% of that's down to better seed varieties, and that's where we'll focus today because that's where we get into the biotechnological revolution, hasn't it? has a real role to play in improving the seed varieties that we generate. And then last but not least, you create this fantastic food source. Other things think it's also a fantastic food source. So fungi and insects think, my goodness, a free meal here. So you actually need to protect your crops, either through building in resistance or by spraying chemicals which counteract those pests and diseases. If you look at seeds, there are three sort of component technologies. One is traditional breeding. The second one is biomarker-assisted breeding, and the third one's genetic engineering. And if you look at maize in particular, this is where we started out in Mexico a couple of hundred years, well, probably a couple of thousand years ago now, and this is kind of where we've ended up. You can see the enormous change created in terms of the food product productivity of a maize plant. And similarly, tomatoes have gone from this to this. Enormous changes. Rice goes from a nice sort of fluffy grass to a very compact, high-yielding um, cereal. So traditional breeding's had a massive, massive impact. But in those areas where we've relied only on traditional breeding, the yield gains are now starting to plateau. Whereas those areas such as uh, soy and maize where genetic engineering's played a role, the yield gains are continuing to rise faster than the demands of food security. Biotech has a key role to play in this, not only in terms of improving our understanding of what's going on within the plants, but actually starting to engineer them. And in the early days, we focused on input traits. And it's no coincidence that things like herbicide tolerance and insect resistance is down to one gene change, because we knew how to do that, and we know how to do it pretty reliably. If you move over to output traits, which are much more consumer-focused, where you're talking about quality, uh, nutritional uh, benefits and processing benefits, they are multiple gene changes are involved and it's much more difficult to do. From simple, relatively simple pathway engineering, as we've heard a lot about in the last day and a half, to looking at controlling abiotic stresses. How do you build in drought tolerance? How do you build in salt tolerance? And actually, we don't really understand how to do that. We do it through traditional breeding and combining that germplasm with the elite germplasm that we develop through other means. So we're moving slowly in this direction. And clearly, synthetic biology provides us tools to improve our understanding, uh, but also then to exploit that understanding to develop better crops. And this is a slide I've borrowed from Monsanto. I've just tried to persuade my colleagues at Syngenta to generate a similar slide, but they have not done so, so I will continue to promote Monsanto's good work. Um, if, you, if you look at just simply herbicide-tolerant maize, yeah, so you spray it, you sp sorry, you plant it, you overspray it with glyphosate, it kills all weeds, it eliminates the competition for nutrients and light and water. You can get 94 bushels an acre. I have no idea what that is in tons per hectare. Um, if you build in uh, protection against corn borer, which is in the green stem, it burrows into the stem and, and causes massive yield damage, then you put the yield up. If you apply an insecticide, and here they use our Syngenta's insecticide force, it controls corn rootworms and nematodes and other uh, pests, and you put the yield up again, but pesticides are designed to degrade over the season, so their effect falls off with time. So if you actually put the insect resistance, the Bt toxin, into the roots as well, you get season-long control. And so by stacking the genes, by putting in two insect-resistant genes on top of the herbicide tolerance, you, you double the yield that you get from your crop. You're getting close to much closer to realizing the full genetic potential of the seed. What we've seen is that there are other, other factors that, that come into play. And I'll touch on them in a moment. But we're starting to also see processing benefits. So the Amflora potato from BSF is designed to generate starches which have an industrial use. And yet this has struggled to get through the regulatory system in Europe. 
In the US, Syngenta has developed uh, uh, corn, which uh, the alpha amylase kicks in as soon as you start processing it. It actually gives you enormous cost benefits in terms of ethanol production, making it a much more viable process. Uh, but again, it struggled to get through the regulatory system because it was the first sort of industrial biotech application from uh, plants. But of course, food's not just all about growing plants. We do a lot of work in stainless steel, and it's much easier in stainless steel. I could only find this old slide, I'm afraid, so it only goes up to the 1990s, but the trend is very clear in that vitamin production in particular and other chemicals, making them in stainless steel is big business. And this quote's taken from DSM's website last week, and they see real, real benefits in terms of replacing uh, traditional wet chemistry with bugs. You know, you just need to put the bug in, give it a bit of sugar, keep it warm, off it goes. Fantastic. And this, this is really good. And so now what we're starting to see is you've engineered these pathways to maximize the productivity of these microbes and to develop these really important uh, food supplements. You can also do it with flavors and processing enzymes. We're now starting to take some of that knowledge and build it back into plants in terms of biofortification. So where we see synthetic biology starting to play, and it's all about this amassing knowledge to try and improve what we can do today. Uh, systems biology is key in terms of developing our understanding. And it was said right at the very beginning, you know, systems biology helps with the understanding and synthetic biology helps to take advantage of that understanding. The big drivers are in terms of increasing disease and pest resistance, that's building it in to the seed and therefore into the plant rather than spraying chemicals afterwards. One is a protective mechanism, the other one tends to be a recovery mechanism. We need to get better at using existing water supplies and nutrients. Um, so you can put less water on and get the same yield. I'll show a picture of that in a moment. Uh, and also improving nutrient use efficiency. Reduce the amount of, of uh, nitrate fertilizer. You reduce the cost to the farmer. You reduce the potential from runoff in terms of pollution. You reduce the potential to put nitrous oxide into the atmosphere and therefore the greenhouse gas potential. More and more we need plants which will tolerate and crops which will tolerate uh, drought, flood, salt and heat. So for example, as the climate heats up, I think with wheat, I think it switches off at 32 degrees. It's somewhere around there. The uh, seed step doesn't happen. So if you get a very hot day at the wrong time, you don't get any seed set. Um, and we know that uh, drought really damages yield uh, and also salt tolerance. So the Central Valley in California, because of all the irrigation, is slowly becoming more and more saline and productivity starting to decline. Increasing the efficiency of your plant, I mean, yield is everything. If you can deliver yield as part of a good agronomic system, you can tick a lot of those boxes. Uh, the system being developed at the moment is called Sustainable Intensification of Agriculture, and yield is the key. By maximizing the productivity of existing arable land, you protect all those wilderness areas. Uh, and overall, the global biodiversity stabilizes, increases. And then last but not least, we can use plants to produce chemicals, as we've done for thousands of years. We can just get more efficient at it and start producing different chemicals. And the trend really is going from being able to do very simple stuff almost in a random fashion to start to do quite complicated stuff very, very targeted. And some of the talks we've heard in the last uh, 24 hours or so have exemplified that really well where that understanding, that ability to precisely target makes a big, big difference to what we can do. So just some examples of some of the areas. So this is uh, an internal in-house project where what we've done is we've made, I think it's now 8,000 crosses of different tomatoes. We've mapped all the genomes. We've mapped all the metabolomes. We've put them through taste trials. And we then correlated the three layers of data to find out what constitutes a high flavor, high yielding, good quality tomato. Um, and that corresponds with various QTLs and then you can build them into your next generation of tomato, which gives you a very high flavored, good processing and good eating tomatoes. So you're having to bring together lots of big data sets to enable you to do that. Rice, one of the staple crops in the world, 
China's approved BT rice. It's, it's been approved, but as yet not supposed to be planted. But if you talk to people around the world, they're finding it in most rice supplies around the world. Although technically it's not supposed to be out there yet. They're building pest resistance in. They're building in abiotic stress resistance. Biofortification, golden rice. Golden rice is a very, very interesting example. In the early days, people said, look, you're, not, you know, you're just doing this for the benefit of the farmer and the benefit of the big companies. Why aren't you doing this to benefit people? So two Swiss academics, uh, Peter Bayer and Ingo Petritus, uh, switched on the beta-carotene uh, production system in rice seed to, to create yellow rice seed, golden rice. And the idea was you'd give this to uh, third world populations who only ate rice. Because at the moment, something like between quarter and half a million children go blind every year because of vitamin A deficiency. And then something like two or three million die every year as a consequence of that and other deficiencies, primarily zinc uh, and iron. And yet that has been resisted. It's been fought tooth and nail by a number of so-called green organizations. Um, and I personally find it uh, almost morally bankrupt that they're, for the case, because of ideology, they're willing to sacrifice the lives of all these children. But it shows you the fight that's, that's taking place. In Japan, they're looking in a different way. They're trying to use genetic engineering to take out allergens. A number of food intolerances. There are also projects on decaffeinating coffee. Um, so you can actually grow it decaffeinated, which is really nice. And then last but not least, people are now looking at converting rice from a C3 into a C4 plant because allegedly they're 25% more productive. Um, and that's just another way of trying to bump up the yield and convert the the energy of the sun into useful food. Uh, <coughs> soybean is a main source of protein for animal feed. Uh, the, the volumes of production are growing year on year. We're now starting to see uh, the introduction of high omega-3 levels uh, engineered into the soybean uh, to stop the um, wastage almost of, of uh, oily fish. We're seeing changes in terms of stearic acid levels to improve processing characteristics. And we're seeing the buildup of, you know, building in uh, primarily disease resistance. There's a lot of concern about soybean rust. And this will just take out your whole crop if you get it. And actually, it's done fantastically well for our profits in terms of our fungicide sales. Because uh, if you don't spray, you lose pretty much all your crop, which is big money. Biotech wheat, uh, it's interesting, Monsanto a number of years ago actually engineered a, a, a herbicide tolerant wheat but never commercialized it. I think at the time there was no appetite for hybrid wheat uh, to be used uh, and also there's a big fear around well, the main wheat markets are in Europe and of course GM in Europe don't, aren't very compatible. We're looking at pesticide uh, pest resistant wheat and, and most people will have heard about Rothamsted because of the campaign against them over the last few months. They've done a really good job at engaging the detractors of this technology. Uh, and that's a very interesting strategy in terms of repelling aphids and bringing in the parasitic wasps. Control it. Similarly, we're working with Simit, who are a, a, a not-for-profit breeding organization to try and share our expertises. And there's work going on in well, you see it again, salt tolerant, biofortification, drought tolerant, the same sort of problems. In maize, which is probably the most engineered crop, you start, there's a lot of work on Im improved nitrogen utilization, increasing yield, improving its use as, a, as an animal feed and helping the animals to process it better. Uh, the ethanol we mentioned, drought tolerance. And this just shows you some pictures. So if you get drought during grain fill, this is what happens. And the introduction of the drought tolerant varieties are both Syngenta and Monsanto have introduced, actually have found you get a 10% yield benefit, even in the absence of obvious drought. So there was clearly water stress taking place that people weren't aware of. But you can get even cleverer, and here's some, just some plants. So seven weeks with normal water, one week without and then two weeks with normal water. This one survived, this one didn't. So clearly, you know, if you can identify and pick out the genes that are responsible for that, 
and then transfer them, you're onto a very good uh, protection strategy. I mentioned the nutritional enhancement, same two examples. So the uh, beta carotene, which you've seen already in other contexts to give you golden rice, and also the omega-3 soya. But these are just early examples. People are looking at trying to breed in high zinc uh, content into uh, rice in particular uh, and other possibilities. We're well aware there are lots of things you can do in plants. Um, we can start by developing these tools that you've all been talking about to start to take advantage of the real power of plants. I mean, we have fantastic biodiversity in which to draw, and so far that's what we've been doing, been learning from one plant and transferring it to another. But there's another, we can raise our game even further. You get all these Fs, food, feed, fiber, fuel, pharma, fine chemicals, whatever you want to do, uh, but they're all very relevant because food production systems or plant production systems can be scaled up very rapidly. Um, metabolic engineering, you've all played with artemisinin, we've heard of endlessly, but you can do it with food production, you can remove allergens and toxins, you can reduce lignin levels, which is interesting in terms of you know, lignocellulose uh, and into uh, biofuels. And then last but not least, we've not heard much about it, but you can produce proteins in plants. I mean, and similarly, we produce therapeutic proteins in animals as well. And of course, most recently, which I'm not qualified to talk about, there's a GM fish going through the regulatory process in uh, the USA. So really, the key is better understanding. And that's really what this is all about. And it's really trying to do what we can do today in microbes and move them into plants. And as Alain said yesterday, plants take much longer <laughs> in terms of their generation times. So it's a much, much slower process. But it really is about that understanding, the signaling mechanisms, the control mechanisms, the, the uh, expression mechanisms, to enable you to do it in tissue specifically. So whether it's flowering, or whether it's in the green leaves, or whether it's in the roots. Um, and some of these are temporal effects, so can you trigger them all in sequence? which is an interesting one as well. You know, and just messing about with jasmonic acid, as you saw yesterday, actually <laughs> just lots of different things, not just the one you first thought of. So we just don't have the level of understanding yet to enable us to do all that. However, there is a downside to all of this. <clears throat> You'll be well aware that the uh, Research Council has sponsored this discussion on synthetic biology because they're very concerned at what happened in Europe over GM technology. And I think we have to get to a position where we can integrate and balance risk perception and mitigation versus the potential benefits. This is exactly what happens in pharmaceuticals at the moment. It does not happen in food. And in Europe in particular, we've had a real problem with GM. And a lot of that have been very, very effective campaigning and lobbying by a by so-called Green Coalition but a lot of it's been based on promoting fear and downright misinformation. And also scientists not understanding how best to engage in that debate. So I too was very guilty of trying to beat people over the head with logic. And what they were really worried about was, you know, an, an interaction at an emotional level. We've got more sophisticated, we're better at that. We've also more willing to stand up in public and take the flack which I know a number of us, including me, were not willing to do in the early days, but I'm very willing to do nowadays. And one of the things fired out is, was this is only benefiting farmers, it's only benefiting the big companies, but actually it benefits much wider than that. So helping farmers, they lose 25 billion tons of soil every year. Why are African rivers brown? The answer is they're full of soil. Why can't they grow crops? Because they've got no soil left, and there's hardly any nitrogen in it. Uh, herbicide tolerance uh, and also uh, some other um, total herbicides such as Paraquat enables no-till which prevents soil erosion and actually improves the quality of the soil and puts up your yield. It helps to reduce water and there are other ways of managing water very carefully. Improving yield ticks off all the beneficial parameters including energy, water, inputs, uh, production, and last but not least, improving uh, productivity reduces 
the CO2 emissions from agriculture. And yeah, actually, if we get this right, we benefit the environment as well. We also benefit the consumers, and people take for granted cheap and plentiful food. I once sent to a politician who was complaining at a conference I was at that they weren't really talking about security, and I was saying, well, it's not on your agenda. I said, but as soon as Sainsbury's supermarket shelves are empty, I said, I bet you it's number one on your agenda. In fact, there's an old Byzantine proverb, isn't it? When I've got plenty of food, I've got hundreds of problems. When I've got no food, I've only got one. And so it is important to get this right. We need to feed the population fairly and equitably. And technology has its role. The other thing is time. So from first construct to commercialization takes about 12 years. That's a long time in it. And by becoming more certain with what we do and having this better understanding and having these tools, we can do this faster. And the faster you, you can do this, then the sooner you get to the market. So we're working on things which will take 12 and more years to get there. And that's not just the regulatory process. It's the whole thing of you know, getting stable constructs and then bulking up the seed as well. The other thing is cost. This is some data that was uh, published last year by Crop Life International. The cost of bringing a single plant biotech trade to market, the average cost is $136 million. And of that, 35 plus million is due to regulatory requirements. Now, if you generate a new crop, uh, or a new variety, I should say, through traditional breeding, the cost to get it through the regulatory process is the order of, well, I think it's maximum $200,000. If you develop a novel food, which includes a GM food, then it's at least 35 million. And there are cases where it's more than 60 million on top of everything else. So most people play in this space and they think it's not very, and this is one of the problems with the uh, uh, organization like CGIAR, they develop the first construct and they think they've got it, hey, I've got this, you know, I don't know, uh, pest-tolerant cassava. Actually, commercializing that takes a lot more effort and a lot more cost, and we need to, to recognize that. So I think, you know, we have a lots of opportunities ahead of us. You know, we and other big companies continue to invest in this space. There's a lot of excitement at government level in this space. And really, it's about integrating that understanding with the tools to exploit that understanding. In terms of crop production, it really is about, you know, delivering that maximum genetic potential in the field uh, and improving the yield and the quality of what you're producing. It is, in some cases, transferring plant processes into microbes, as we saw with the uh, amorphodiene cyclase. In many other cases, it'll be transferring it the other way around because scaling up is easy if you can get it in the oil seeds. You know, we crush oil seeds and extract oil on enormous scales, whereas fermentation doesn't really compete so well. We have to convince the consumers that there's something in it for them, uh, otherwise nothing will happen. And actually, there are some sort of almost science fiction-y type things, but, you know, whenever I talk to my children about GPS and tracking systems, I always remember James Bond's Aston Martin, in Goldfinger, and I thought that was really fantastic and cool, but I knew it was made up. Well, I've got one in my car now, it's great. <laughs> so, so even when you think it's science fiction, you can, you can get there. But it's interesting, you see, algae, the top growing algae, convert CO2 into biomass a lot faster than plants. Can we engineer things that go even faster and faster and actually pull carbon dioxide out of the air to reverse uh, the, the problems with greenhouse gas emissions and actually then trap that all in the soil in terms of biomass and improve soil all over the world. In terms of feeding the world, sustainable intensification is the whole system of which plant biotechnology plays one part, but it's about making those tools available throughout the world to enable us to, to deliver the increased yield, to improve the quality, and last but not least, to protect that yield so that we can provide enough high quality food to feed the whole population. So just as a final thought, really, you know, we are starting to get to the position where we have the knowledge and the technology 
to engineer multiple changes into plants. And that's improving every day. You know, and I've heard some fantastic stuff so far, and I'm sure I'll hear some more fantastic stuff. And actually, the first early opportunities are in terms of chemical synthesis, either in microbes or in plants, and actually pathway engineering, as we've heard, again, in plants and in microbes. So I think there's a, the future is bright. Thank you very much.